Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Radio Renaissance. I'm your host, Jared Taylor, with American Renaissance, and with me is my indispensable co-host, none other than Paul Kersey. And we'd like to begin the podcast with uh, a comment, a comment from a listener who says, in last week's program, you expressed the sentiment that the only solution to black enmity, distrust, and boundless resentment would be to separate. I agree. But how would we do that? Should one declare one or several states to be black only? My vote would be for that to be New York and New Jersey, says the listener. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think there could be some disagreement about that. Anyway, would they become a separate countries with passport controls on the borders? If so, certain foreign nations would surely have to lend the black free state money, maintain their infrastructure, and eventually become a military presence. I'm not sure I'd agree with that. Look at even Zimbabwe. Burkina Faso, you know, they live on foreign aid, but uh, they don't have quite the kind of hovering white presence that uh, this listener suggests. If not separate nations, it may be a federation of states as in Switzerland. Now, the listener goes on to say, my prediction is that we will continue as we have been until the U.S. dollar hegemony finally ends, wrecked by excessive spending in Washington, D.C. The U.S. defaults on the debt and the economy collapses. Then the clamor will be for a strong man and a solution, and then matters will be fixed, in quotation marks. Probably the cure will be worse than the disease. Well, I don't know about any of that either, but I think that a real first step would be the government simply to stop trying to push people together and recognize that it is perfectly legitimate for people of all races to wish to live in a racially, culturally coherent way and just get out of the way. Most people would be happier that way. That would be an excellent first step. And people want to mix it up. People who really believe that diversity is our greatest strength, God bless them, let them try it out. But that is as far as I have ever suggested going. And eventually, if you can build on that and have a completely separate sovereign state, so much the better. But in terms of how things will collapse, I think that is entirely possible. I mean, we're now, uh, the government debt is uh, over 100% of gross national product. I think the federal debt is about seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 for every, every man, woman, and child in the country. That's uh, more than net worth of a whole lot of families in this country. So... Uh, but yes, I think, as I say, a first step would be to enshrine the idea of voluntary separation. Any comments or ideas, Mr. Kersey? Yeah, yeah I think that's going to be, let me come in nice and slow real quick. And by the way, I'd like to extend a happy Good Friday to you and all of our listeners around the world on this uh, beautiful uh Early spring day of 2024, Mr. Taylor. Yeah, I, I think ultimately the 21st century is going to be defined by this. And when we decide to let go of the attempt of the 20th century to force this, to mandate this. And I think that's that's fundamentally where we are right now. Yep, it's a psychological change that has to be achieved if white people are to survive as distinct people with distinct cultures. And... As I've said over and over again, the way blacks and some Hispanics talk about us, we are so horrible. We are so bad. They should be happy to say bye bye. But they never apparently are. They want us around. Make sure somebody knows how to fix the high power tension lines, repair jet engines, make sure that the houses don't leak. A few things, a few handy things like that that white people are good at. But anyway, uh, now, if you listeners out there in listener land, if you would like to send in a comment or a question or, and I like corrections, anytime we say something incorrect or even doubtful, I like to hear about it. Mr. Kersey doesn't like to hear about it, but I do. And so please, please send your comments and questions either to amren.com, A-M-R-E-N.com in the contact us page, amren.com, contact us, or you simply send me an email and I'd love to get them. Because we live here at protonmail.com. Once again, that email address is because we live here at protonmail.com. Very good, Mr. Kersey. And yes, we welcome your messages, one and all. Now let's start 
with something that appears to be an increasing matter of concern among our rulers, among the mighty and the wise. And that's what we used to call people playing hooky or chronic truancy. But now they don't call it anymore. It's called chronic absenteeism. And this is a big article from the New York Times. And it was about the fact, it starts with the fact that schools shut down in the spring of 2020 at the start of the pandemic. Some did not open until a year and a half later, fall of 2021. But even now, students are still not coming back, back to school. Now, these are eye-opening numbers to me. Before the pandemic, about 15% of U.S. students were considered chronically absent, which typically means missing at least 18 days of school for any reason at all, 18 days. By 2021, that, I'm sorry, by 21, by 2021, 2022, that was after the pandemic, the number had risen from 18% to 28% chronic absent. And last year, they came down slightly. This is the second year post-COVID. It came down slightly to 26%, but there are still an awful lot of people playing hooky regularly. And the New York Times has the numbers over the past several years, 2016, 17, is 13%, then up to 15%, 15%, 13%, then this great void of COVID. And then the year after COVID, 28%, then the year after that, 26%. And when it comes to, they've got things broken out in the, in the usual ways, except there is a certain way of breaking things out that they have tended to avoid. In the richest districts, as they call it, before the pandemic, chronic absenteeism was 10%, which seems surprisingly high to me, and it's now 19%. Whereas uh, in all students, all across the country, it was 15%, 26%. The poorest districts, it was 15% before the pandemic, and now it's up to 32%, uh, as opposed to 26% for the country at large. Now, they do also break it out by majority non-white school districts and majority white school districts, which doesn't necessarily catch the racial differences because you could have a majority white school district in which a lot of the minority students are not going to school. But the majority white, majority non-white school districts, the chronic absenteeism rate was 17% before the pandemic and 30% now, 30%, pretty high. Majority white, it was 13%, and then it went up to, it's now 22%. Now, just out of curiosity, I looked up some of the overwhelmingly black school districts. And if you go to East St. Louis, Mr. Kersey, guess what the chronic absenteeism late rate in St. East St. Louis is? All right, you and said, I give just you some hints. I'll give you some hints. The national rate is 26%. And when you go to majority non-white rate, non-white districts, it's 30%. East right. St. Louis, as we know, is awfully melanin enhanced. It is melanin supercharged. So what do you reckon the chronic absenteeism rate would be in the East St. Louis public schools? And Mr. Taylor, just to go back to what you said, chronic yes. uh, constitutes uh, absenteeism. That's 18 days or more miss, correct? That's right, 18 okay. days I or more. I guess 65%. Wow, you are almost spot on, 64%. Holy cow. Ooh. You calumniate East St. Louis. It's not as bad as you think. Now, Detroit, on the other hand, is a full 66%. That's, I mean, that's, that's really quite incredible. astonishing when you think about it. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that every school day, two thirds of the people are gone. And it would be interesting to know at these heavily, heavily chronically absent places, how long are is the average chronically absent student out for? Who knows? But Detroit, 66, Baltimore, 54 percent. And it, it's quite interesting that uh, the New York Times goes on and says that even the length of the school closure during the pandemic was not a particularly useful predictor of who was going to stay out. I think a lot of people just got used to not going to school. 
And uh, uh, they've got various experts who are saying, oh, underlying it is a fundamental shift in the value that families place on school and the culture of education, our our relationship with schools became optional, blah, blah, blah. Uh, And although, now this is an interesting thing too, the school buildings are of course open, classes are in person and sports and other extracurricular activities are back in swing, but students overall, just don't seem to be showing up the way they used to. Now, the New York Times gives an interesting example of a kind of chronic absenteeism that would not have occurred to me, and this is among rich white people. They talk about a wealthy school district in Alaska where all the course materials and the assignments are now online, so families decide to take a Hawaii vacation in the off-season on the assumption that uh, after a day at the beach, Junior can hold up this computer in a hotel room and catch up. Ha <laughs> ha. So, and maybe Junior can. It's an interesting idea. But people are not going back to school. I read along a New Yorker article about it too. And the New Yorker said nothing about race, but it was a chock a block full of case studies. And all of the names of the students that they talked about were LaShondas and Leroy's and Deshaun's. It's pretty clear who they were talking about. But there are some white people who are not showing up to school, too. But I would love to see actual specific race statistics and not by majority white, majority non-white. And some of the majority majority non-white student places, I don't know, you might have a lot of Asians. And it's all very unclear. Taylor, if, I could, if I could jump in and also give Please. a hypothesis on why white people might have high rates of, of absenteeism, uh, not truancy, but just not being in school. That's because as you progress farther and farther in the field of athletic endeavor, you're going to do a lot of traveling, of travel baseball, travel lacrosse. Oh, uh, but, but, but those are excused soccer. absences. Surely those are excused absences. They are totally they? not. Ex- I, I can tell you firsthand. Uh, I have a firsthand knowledge that they are not excused and very right. frowned. On, when you miss out well, on on that type, because it's not school affiliated, you're doing it outside of school. Okay, but that would not explain why pre-pandemic there was X percent, and then post-pandemic is X percent plus ten percent. That is not explained by that phenomenon. Anyway, it, it's a, it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, although, as I have often said, if you want to know, if you want to predict the future of the United States. All you need is one statistic, and that is that by the time they actually manage to graduate, blacks and Hispanics are reading and doing arithmetic at the average level of the average white or Asian eighth grader. They are four years behind, and that's going to be the new workforce. Meanwhile, I have another story about Gemini AI. We laughed about Gemini Gemini AI. I think that was just last week, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe the week before. That's the Google artificial intelligence program that thinks the founders were black women. And it won't draw a picture of a white family, but will draw a family of any other race. And when prompted to create images of Nazi, it was so diverse and so inclusive that it showed people of various races. Wearing SS uniforms. Oh boy, I guess the Africa <laughs> Corps, you know, that was another SS unit, remember? Like Das Reich. Uh, and <laughs> anyway, now there's news that when an author by the name of Peter Hassan asked this Gemini AI program questions about a book he wrote in 2020, he found that the chatbot actually concocted a series of fake reviews of people who panned the book. Now, why would that be? The book is called The Manipulators, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and Big Tech's War on Conservatives. Mm. In other words, this is a book that bashes these search engines and uh, the whole internet uh, crushing of certain unpopular views. Of course, it was about the political biases of these big tech, and apparently it struck such a nerve with Google that its AI program must have been told to lie in an attempt to smear this book. This is this is almost more difficult for me to believe than black founding fathers, because this is not some this is this would have had to require some kind of artificial tuning of the algorithm. But as part of Google's description of the book, it wrote that it had been criticized for lacking concrete evidence and relying on anecdotal information. 
And this guy followed the reviews of his book very closely. He couldn't recall any criticism like that. So he asked, he asked the chatbot who made these comments. It then supplied him with summaries of four negative reviews that were allegedly from the New York Times, Wired, Washington Free Beacon, and New York Times Book Review. Every single review was completely invented. And the quotes that Gemini attributed to the authors were 100% bogus. Uh, my, uh, the mind boggles at this, uh, that uh, Google went to the trouble of instructing its AI program to slam this book with false reviews. And when Hassan asked Gemini to provide him with the source links for these reviews, even though he knew they didn't exist, it seemed to panic and suddenly claimed it was unable to help. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, it, it makes me wonder. Uh, I'd like to see what uh, what Gemini thinks about some of my books. I wonder if they have been. I wonder if uh, Gemini has been instructed to say negative and untrue things about my books. But anyway, Mr. Kersey, you have a heartwarming story about how New York City is facing its man on the moon moment. Isn't this inspiring? It is inspiring, but here I'm going to give you a sneak peek of what AI would say about your books. One, white okay. identity is an invalid concept, only parroted by bigots. And uh, if we do nothing, another title of your book, that's what we hope happens. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't do anything. Yes, let the future just roll in upon us. Celebrate yeah. every moment of it. Well, I think you're right. But I'll try. I'll try. I'll see what uh, what these various artificial intelligences or sometimes their natural stupidities have to say about my books. But yes, tell us tell us about this new moonshot. Yeah, Mayor Eric Adams likens new New York Police Department gun scanners and subways to JFK wanting man on the moon. He says, quote, our Sputnik moment, end quote. So the New York Police Department is set to start rolling out a new technology that will scan uh, for firearms, strap hangers for firearms in subway stations amid a wave of underground violence. Hisner showed off a freestanding scanner manufactured by Evolve, a weapons detection company. Mind you, by the way, it might be worth looking into to uh, invest in if they go public uh, at the busy Fulton Transit Center in lower Manhattan as the mayor touted details of a soon to be implemented pilot program. As you said, quote, this is our Sputnik moment. Like when Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon. Let's bring on the scanners, end quote. <laughs> That's oh, the dear. black man from New York. Uh, by the way, it's pronounced his honor. And it's. His Shorthand honor. for his honor, yes. But I like that. His honor. His honor and her honor. But uh well, gosh. Honor. So I, so what exactly so I'm sorry, so yeah. is that is that the is that uh is that a title of the mayor or I'm sorry, is that the title of the company? Forgive me for not knowing that. No, no, his honor, the the mayor. That is a mayor's official title, his honor. And sometimes, uh, particularly in New York papers, they refer to the mayor as H-I-Z-Z-O-N-E-R or something like that. His honor. It's just an informal way of referring to the mayor. So you don't have to say the mayor, the mayor, the mayor all the time. But be that as it may, I guess for Eric Adams, actually cutting down on gunplay in the subway is going to be as much of a remarkable achievement as putting a man on the moon in the Kennedy era. That's the way he seems to be. Th this is going to be a miraculous, a full tilt, uh, all hands on deck achievement. This is actually laughable that, that you just uh, compared to that, because, yeah, you think about when yes. Kennedy made that made that announcement again. I was born in the mid 80s. I think that was what when he became. When he became president or when he was running for president, was that in 60, 61 when he made that pronouncement that we would put a man on the moon by the end of the, by the end of the decade. I think Sputnik was what, 57. So again, our Sputnik moment, uh, I think the, I think Mayor Adams has his, has his space history a little bit misaligned, but that's all right. Because again, Giuliani and Bloomberg showed you how to make New York city safe. And that's what's stopping Frisk. That's with that's broken true. windows policing. So, um, yeah. 
Yeah, but he thinks now, uh, uh, is there any more about how this technology is going to work? It can give you, it, it's a metal detector from, from afar. Is, that, is yeah, everybody going to be walking through a frame like a TSA? How's gonna, it going to work? Everyone's going to be walking through these this this radioactive uh, transmitter. The mayor wouldn't say how many of the scanners will be initially set up in the subway system or at which stations when the program eventually gets underway in the coming months. I believe it's not for another 90 days, so three months out that this technology is going to be uh, actually erected and, and put up in, in undisclosed locations. And again, the exact logistics aren't immediately clear, including whether every uh, strap hanger will have to walk through the scanner immediately before or after the turnstile, mm. or if there's a chance they could sidestep the detector altogether. Mm. Uh, critics were quick to rip the new technology with law enforcement. Uh, with law enforcement, hold on a second, with law enforcement telling the New York Post the city could just invest in more cops instead. We don't need more robots. We need cops, not just for the trains, but for patrol and everywhere else. Robots will not fix anything, one cop source said. Uh, NYPD is playing TSA now in the subways, just another inconvenience in the subway system. Uh, give me one second while I peruse the article to find out your question. Uh, and of course, that is buried down here. Uh, again, the gun detector technology, it doesn't even say where it is. Let's see here. Hold on. Well, well. Yeah, I, I just quickly flashed through the article, Mr. Taylor, and it doesn't tell you how the technology even works hmm. in terms hmm. of, uh, let's see here, despite touting the new gun tech, gun detectors, the pilot program won't get underway until July, advertising its intent to use electromagnetic weapons detection system due to the POST Act law. So they have to wait 90 days. I don't know what the POST Act law is. If that's something that they have to wait to implement something, but again, all you have to do is do stop and frisk. I mean, this isn't hard. This is this is what made New York City going from. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, if they do have a TSA style uh, security procedure to get into the subway, it'll mean you might have to back up for 15 minutes, stand in line, go through all of this. It's going to make it uh, very, very disagreeable to ride the subway. But it'll work. When's the last time you pulled a, heard of somebody pulling a gun on an airplane? It, it it does work if you do it that way. But as you say, stop and fricks is, uh, is the clear way not only to get guns off the street, but lock up the bad guys. It, it, it's so much more than simply finding people with drugs and guns. It really gives the police an opportunity to get a hold of black, bad people and put them where they belong. But you no, know, the idea that he's going to make the he, likening it to the moonshot, it just goes to show you what a terrible problem it is for these guys and what lack of imagination they have. They think they're going to need 21st or 22nd century technology to do the obvious thing. Boy, oh boy. Good luck, Eric. Yeah, but, you know, Mr. Taylor, I don't have the exact stats in front of me, but somebody posted an article on Twitter that something like a hundred individuals were responsible for being arrested and committing crimes, totaling well over a thousand crimes on the New York subway. So all you have to do, the police know who these people are. They've been arrested time and time again. Recidivism is just yeah. off the charts. You just arrest these people. You do what uh, Bucali has done uh, in El Salvador. I mean, basically, the ultimate yeah. question of the 21st century is this. It's very simple, Mr. Taylor. Do white people in America have the constitution that Bucali had in El Salvador to put the people of El Salvador first ahead of the civil rights of El Salvadoran criminals? Well, That's it. The Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, I believe that uh, a long-standing statistic in American criminology is that every felon you take off the street has actually committed at least a dozen other felonies by the time you finally catch it. And once they're, once they're in, they can't commit any more while they're there. Be that as it may, moving on to Columbia University, Columbia will host a variety of special graduations based on race and sexual orientation. These multicultural graduation celebrations aim to provide, quote, more intimate settings for students who self-identify in various ways. There will be segregated ceremonies for Asians, Blacks, Latinx, and Lavender. 
I bet you can guess who the lavender people are, Mr. Kersey. Now, better that says, <laughs> <laughs> yes, better not. Among other categories. Now, I'd love to know what the other categories are. I don't know, mentally handicapped or committed communists or what are the other categories? I think it's all quite fascinating. But with all of these ceremonies being sponsored or co-sponsored by Columbia's Multicultural Affairs Office. Now, this is the only reason I found this of any significance. The, much, the Multicultural Affairs Office, right on its website, in big, bold letters, says diversity and inclusion are central to the student experience. Diversity and inclusion. Boy, oh boy. They are practicing inclusion by having these segregated ceremonies. Well, God bless them. You know, we believe in segregation to voluntary segregation. And if the lavender rites and the Latinx and Asians, uh, they want their own, maybe we want our own too. In the meantime, here's an interesting story about wildlife management, which I provide with no commentary. The barred owl has become an emerging threat to the spotted owl. It, is, it has a larger appetite and competes for the same prey and is moving into the territory of the spotted owl. Spotted owls measure about one and a half feet in length, while the barred owl is more bigger. It's two feet tall. And sometimes the barred owl kills spotted owls. Fish and Wildlife Service says competition from the invasive barred owl is a primary cause of the rapid and ongoing, ongoing decline of the northern spotted owl. It is critical that we manage invasive barred owl populations to reduce their negative effect. And you know what they're going to do? The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service plans to unleash hunters in California, Oregon, and Washington to kill about half a million barred owls. Hunters will broadcast barred owl territorial calls to attract owls and shoot on sight. Just a little item I pass along for those who have an interest in wildlife control. Now, here is a story from South Africa. Mr. Taylor, and, may, I, may, may I be so bold to interrupt and bring up another yes. story about wildlife Please. control? Please. Uh, a few years ago, a good friend of mine lived in Miami, and he told me about how the state of Florida was paying hunters to go into the Everglades to take care of the python yes. explosion that was yes. endangering the Everglade indigenous population. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They were basically going in and uh, decimating the indigenous population uh, of food that was traditionally there for the alligator. Well, and, now, yeah, yeah. Now, were they were they competing with alligators? Uh, but because there, there are no indigenous pythons in Florida, but they, they were they were. Uh, out reproducing and out competing the uh, alligators. Oh, it's it's an amazing story of how many, of how many babies these 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 female pythons produce and and how rapidly they reproduce. And I saw an amazing documentary where these these and and these are all white good old boy hunters who are going in there and they're using um they're using a a drone to go up and uh basically um, infrared at night to see how many pythons using heat technology and mm -hmm. find the nest, they then go in and just destroy these nests. Cause you're getting paid handsomely by the state of Florida to get rid of these because the alligator is indigenous and to see these invaders come in and overtake right. the, uh, the alligators uh, domain, that's not cool. <laughs> Well, no, that, that's interesting, though. I wonder how they actually compete. Do they eat the same things, or do they kill the alligators? Do they eat the alligator babies? Uh, do, do you remember how? What, uh, yes, just, they, what they do both of those. They do both I of see. those in terms uh, of well, eating the alligators. And, 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 and there's some amazing videos you can see of a python that has consumed a massive alligator or battles that they've gotten in. And, you know, there's just an interesting little uh, metaphor. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to try and explain what it is. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, just it's uh, just interesting, interesting uh, bit of wildlife management. But the state of Florida well, has sided with the indigenous alligator. So anyways, well, <laughs> mm, mm. siding with the indigenous. OK, well, now here is a story from South Africa and the headline caught my eye. It said, Speaker of South African Parliament accused of taking one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars and a wig. 
in bribes. Oh, they love their wigs. They love their wigs, Mr. Kersey. This is why she was. This is why she was defense minister. Her name is Nosi Viviwe Mapisa Nekukula, Speaker of the National Assembly. She prosecutors say that she received eleven payments totaling one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. She sought another bribe of one hundred five thousand dollars, but didn't get that one. And there was an occasion in February 2019 when she received more than $5,000 and a wig at a meeting at the country's main international airport. Well, she's taken a leave of absence from her role as speaker. She was previously accused of taking bribes, but a parliamentary investigation was dropped in 2021. So that's just a little glimpse of life in the rainbow nation for us. Well, Mr. Kersey, I think you have a glimpse of life in Baltimore for us, equally uplifting. I think we need to rename Baltimore the Port-au-Prince of America. Uh, This is a city. Did you? I I just want to ask before we get started. Yes. I recently was traveling and I went to Pennsylvania and Mr. Taylor on the way home, I took the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And the person that I was driving with, I remarked, it won't be long until this bridge is renamed. Little did I know that it wouldn't be long until that bridge was destroyed. Yeah, just as well that you were not on the bridge when it happened. But No, it was a, it was a, a month or two before, but I'm just curious, what was, what was your immediate reaction when you saw this very important bridge? You know, Baltimore Port is one of America's most important ports. Uh, this was extraordinary to see. Well, gosh, I well, these things happen. These things happen. Now, there are many people who were tempted to say that it was some sort of DEI in terms of uh, people piloting the ship or who had done the design. Uh, There's no evidence of that so far. And uh, um, I was I was as surprised as anyone, of course, but I was even more surprised, frankly, to hear that this is apparently the port that receives the most imported automobiles. Now, I thought most of our imported automobiles came across the Pacific from Asia. Uh, But maybe, uh, how is it that they end up, I guess they go through the Panama Canal. I was very surprised to hear that it's the port that has the most imported automobiles. But that's neither here nor there. But uh, what's the story on uh, Baltimore itself? I believe Baltimore mayor has been up to some shenanigans. Uh, this was this was amazing. Um, you know, I follow Baltimore probably more than most people. I wrote a book about Baltimore. I'm passionate about Baltimore. I think it could be one of America's great cities because, Mr. Taylor, it was once one of America's, if not the world's great cities. Uh, if you go to the archives of Amran.com, sir, you can see that Gregory Hood and I did a great replacement of Baltimore. And 100 years ago at this time, what percentage do you would would you say was uh, was white of Baltimore in oh, 100 years ago? 100 years ago? Oh, must have been 85 percent or at least 80, 80, 85. It was 88 percent white Baltimore. Mm-hmm. You know, for all of our listeners around the world, this is a city that you can go to and you can see a amazing infrastructure of these gorgeous skyscrapers that were built in the 1920s and 30s, very gothic style, as opposed to the glass monstrosities that all look the same. And now you have a city that white people abandoned after the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, just intolerable rates of crime. And it's about a 70 percent black city, all black elected officials and a massive black bureaucracy. And the black mayor was interviewed on MSNBC and he said that critics don't have the courage to say the n-word now what did he mean by that now baltimore mayor brandon scott he's a democrat has accused his critics of racism after many labeled him the dei mayor following the collapse of francis scott key bridge earlier this week well now hold on hold on uh i was only vaguely aware of this story but are they claiming that it's his fault that the bridge fell down i mean there's Uh, no evidence for that no, people are claiming that. People have been pointing out that it looks like Baltimore has a DEI mayor because basically conservatives and people on social media have begun to look at DEI as the as an instrument of the breakdown of an institution. And people are are so afraid of just looking at Baltimore and being like, well, you know, <laughs> 
pretty world class city exists at one point, and 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 they're just afraid to point out that white flight is the reason that everything happened because of intolerable levels of black crime. Once blacks take over, it doesn't matter about the food desert or the heat island that is created or whatever words you want to describe for or ascribe for a failure of a civilization or a city. Black people well, can't be blamed. So, well, the fact is, people talk about Democrats as being miserable city managers. What Republican you could have a you could have the smartest, brainiest Republican and managing Baltimore would be a Herculean task. Maybe you could make a few reforms, nibble a little around, a little bit around the edges. But when you got a seventy percent black city, there's just limits on what you can do, whether you're a DEI mayor Mr. or whether you're the most qualified person on earth. Mr. Taylor, Hercules, if that was one of the twelve labors of Hercules, he would say, I'm done. <laughs> I'll pass on that. That's right. That's right. That's too much for me. I, yeah. You know, I can clean the Augean stables, but I'm going to go Baltimore. ahead. Not yep. Baltimore. <laughs> Make Baltimore safe. Huh, uh, that, you're that's right. A, Bridge yeah. too far. That's a Francis uh, Scott right. bridge too far. Yes. Anyway, um, so the collapse. And, and by the way, I, I woke up. I was I was traveling for for business, and I woke up. And when I saw this, by the way, I, it it looked unbelievable to me. When you see this 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 uh, massive cargo ship hit the bridge, and it just all of a sudden collapses, like it's a like it's a Lego that some kid has has just touched the wrong way, and it just breaks. It was. It was it was very shocking to see. And as the article goes on, uh, after the collapse, social media users, including Utah State Rep Phil Lyman, Republican and Florida congressional candidate Anthony Sabatina, a Republican, attributed the tragedy to diversity, equity and inclusion. They, did. they, they sure did. enough did. I think a that's lot unfair. I think well, that's just plain unfair. There's no evidence for this. Well, anyway. we did. We did see the manifest, the people aboard the ship, and they, I believe they were, excuse me, they all were from India. Well, but they that's not our problem. I mean, uh, they, we didn't hire them. D DEI is an American phenomenon. Now, uh, uh, practically all crews of uh, ocean-going vessels these days are some sort of mystery meat and mishmash of Southeast Asians and Indians and who knows what. Uh, I Well... Uh, I, I think I think it's utterly unfair to blame. I mean, it's possible. It's possible. Now, apparently, there are people who say that they could have built some kind of protective bumpers around the columns of the bridge. And if a bridge were being designed of that kind now, they would require. Yeah, that's correct. Much great, much more reinforced things. But they put this thing together in the 70s at a time when a bulk carrier had maybe t one tenth the mass of this uh, ship that hit it. So now perhaps there was incompetent uh, state or city people who might be DEI types who deferred the who who ignored the possibility of reinforcing the bridge. I don't know, but I, I think it's I think it's uh, I mean it's it's a good instinct to think well maybe DEI could have been a problem, but I just don't see any evidence for it in this case. No, no, it's it's pure speculation and inference, and I can understand why the mayor's angry. He didn't build a bridge. It's not his job to look after bridges. I think it's unfair. Well, I, I would push back. I would say this. The point is people are beginning to notice who's in charge of Baltimore. And when you're spending, you know, Baltimore, Mr. Taylor, we've talked about this city ad nauseum since we've done this podcast. The city has one of the highest rates of per, of per pupil spending. It had high schools that not one student was proficient in mathematics or science. It's a city that black people did not build. It's a city that black people collectively have nothing to do with. It was it was the personification of what the Great Replacement and, um, uh, oh my gosh, forgive me for forgetting the term. Uh, what was it that we called when blacks moved from the South? Oh, that was a great migration. The Great Migration. Yeah. Uh, no, it wasn't like the Great Migration. It was one of the yes, worst episodes in American history. If you look at what's uh, taken place and what is what has just completely overwhelmed some of these just great cities that have that, re again, had nothing to do with the Confederacy, had nothing to do with anything. And then as these places are just I don't want to say the word submerged, but as white people are replaced and as. Again, I, I'm trying to be as politically correct as possible. But again, have you seen this guy speak? Have you seen Brandon Scott? I mean, 
for the past. Do you remember a story, Mr. Taylor, where a white reporter asked the question? There have been three consecutive black female mayors of Baltimore. Is this the reason why the city is collapsing? Remember that? I remember that. She got fired. <laughs> yeah. She got I, I mean, that, that, it's, it's all fine to ask those questions. And the things you're talking about before, the great replacement and uh, the schools, crime rates, all that. Yes, 100%. Uh, where we disagree is that uh, the blacks didn't build a bridge. I mean, were blacks supposed to maintain the bridge? Was it the city of Baltimore's responsibility? I bet there's a state responsibility, a county responsibility, pinning it on this mayor. I mean, he's been in office for how long? Uh, a year? Saying it's his fault? I think that's just completely cuckoo. He's right to be annoyed about it. It might be cuckoo, Mr. Taylor, but I think it's illuminating to believe or to see where we are now. That well, people I'm glad, are, yes, I'm glad that people are talking about DEI, but they should be talking about DEI when it really matters. And in this case, I think they're just, uh, it's pure, it's pure invidious speculation. But anyway, you, you have another a good, that's a very good word to describe it. And again, I'm just happy that people are beginning to really uh, put their heels down and trench and push back because as he told Joy Reid, and you know who Emma, MS, MSNBC's Joy Reid, she's not even she's not even an African American. Her parents were African immigrants to the United States, and um, he told her that these attacks on his identity are rooted in racism. He said, "Quote this: I know, and we know, and you know very well that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only straight wealthy white men should have a say in anything." The Baltimore mayor said Republicans around the nation have taken a stance against DEI, arguing it is a divisive concept that unfairly gives advantages to minorities. Scott argued those blaming DEI for Tuesday's bridge collapse are ignoring that he was elected to office. Quote, we've been the boogeyman for them since the first day they brought us to this country. And what they mean by DEI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent, he said. <laughs> Quote, we know what they want to say. But they don't have the courage to say the N-word. And the fact that I don't believe in their untruthful and wrong ideology, I'm very proud of my heritage and who I am and where I come from, scares them. Because me being at my position means that their way of thinking, their way of life of being comfortable while everyone else suffers is going to be at risk. And they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life, end quote. Again, that's the quote mm. from the black mayor, if I could just – Okay. He said this. Their way of life of being comfortable while everyone else suffers is going to be at risk, and they should be afraid because that's my purpose in life, end quote. Now, well, go ahead. Well, see, that that is a significant quote because it proves that he's one of these complete idiots who thinks that blacks are poor because whites are rich and that it has nothing to do with brains, competence, hard work. He thinks that white people are rigging the game, and that's the only reason why those Baltimore schools have, you have Baltimore schools where not a single student is competent in this, that, or the other, the murder rate, so it's all Whitey's fault. It is clear that he is full to the brim with that kind of foolishness. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I think and, that's, I, I think, Mr. Taylor, and that's why this DEI pushback is so important, because you basically are pushing these people onto the defensive, as opposed to being constantly on the offensive because white people are just afraid to take their own side. And when you push back and you force black people to defend their side, you get this kind of quote. And it's like, hey, dude, like, again, Baltimore has Baltimore had a goofy white mayor, I think, and the um, I forgot his name. He ran for the Democrat candidate for president back in uh, 2015. Um, he was the governor of Maryland. He was an Irish guy. Forgive me for not remember his name. Um, but again, he presided over Baltimore as it was just collapsing into 300 homicides. Remember that Baltimore at one point, Mr. Taylor, I think you and I talked about this. The city is about 620,000 people. There were more homicides in a year, just straight up homicides than there were in New York City for a number of years in a row when New York City has six or seven million people. That's an astonishing figure. Yep, yep. Uh, but again, well, let, uh, let's move on to that other story you have there. Well, the other story, let's see if I can come back up to Baltimore. it. 
Because yeah. I've actually thought about this. This is actually, this seems like a yeah, nice investment. You, you could have fun. Just get yourself a gun permit first. <laughs> That's hard to do in Maryland. So yeah. Baltimore is selling $1 homes amid 15,000 abandoned properties in high crime. And a bid to breathe life back into its beleaguered neighborhoods, the city of Baltimore is rolling out a groundbreaking initiative, selling boarded up homes for a mere dollar each. <laughs> now, the same mayor who says DEI means, hey, you're calling me the N-word, Brandon Scott, is spearheading the plan aimed at tackling the city's long-standing battle with crime and urban decay. Of course, we don't understand who is responsible for the crime and urban decay in Baltimore, but I think you and I know, and we would be uh, lambasted if we dare say who that is by Brandon Scott. With more than 200 city-owned vacant properties up for grabs, residents willing to roll up their sleeves and restore these homes to their former glory are being offered a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Again, 15,000 abandoned properties blighting Baltimore's landscape as of 2022, according to city records. The road to urban renewal remains long and arduous. It boasts one of the highest crime rates in the U.S., if not the world. The probability of falling victim to either violent or property-related offensive offenses in this city, Baltimore, which is about 25% white and 70% black. Mr. Taylor, it's 1 in 21 <laughs> Um, well, now, you know, I saw that figure. Is that per year or per lifetime or per resident uh, for as long as he lives in Baltimore? We have to know what that figure really means. It's actually that means year. 5%. What's that? It's per, per year. year. 5%? Yeah. 5% of the population every year is victim of a crime. Yeah. Pretty high. Pretty, pretty aggressive. Okay. Yeah. So the crime rate surpasses that of communities across the spectrum, ranging from small town to sprawling metropolises. So this one dollar measure greenlit by a city board uh, about a week ago echoes the spirit of Baltimore's historic dollar house program in the 1970s, which saw homesteaders revitalizing communities one house at a time. Newark, New Jersey, uh, as well as Detroit, by the way, has dabbled in a similar scheme, underscoring the urgency of innovative solutions to combat urban blight. Now, of course, Mr. Taylor, again, urban blight. What caused urban blight? Well, well, my question is, they've already tried this in other cities and they've already tried it in Baltimore. Did it work? No data on that. It, it appears in this story. Mm. It's not Did in this it story. Um, it, it has, again, we'd have to look at the historic data. I would say that the fact that Baltimore is trying to do it again, probably shows that it didn't work. So, uh, <laughs> Right. Well, remember, I think it was last week we had stories about incentives that various cities have tried to put in place to get policemen to live in high crime neighborhoods. Louisville and, last year, uh, last week Louisville you talked about was that. One. Louisville was one and Houston was another. In Houston, the Fraternal Order of Police says, you can't pay us to live in those places. So we'll see what the attitude is on people who are offered uh, Homes, homes for one dollar each. I bet a lot of people are going to say no way, no way. Most people are going to say no. Well, we'll see. Mr. And again, you and, it, very, you and I are very familiar with the DMV area, and it's always been my opinion that Baltimore is one of those cities. You've got a major airport, you've got a massive, beautiful infrastructure, you've got access to the Inner Harbor. It's a beautiful city. It's one of the fastest ones that should come back if you bought a high-speed rail between D.C. and Baltimore. So people could live in Baltimore, commute to D.C. If you actually cared about making these communities, these cities well, great again, you'd Mr. have to. Kersey, Mr. Kersey, you can get in on the ground floor and become the next Donald Trump real estate billionaire. Buy up all these $1 a house houses, fix them up, and boy, you are going to be the next property magnet. May I, I counter that with, may I counter that with why it won't work, though? Because <laughs> if I were to do that, I would be called racist for gentrifying Baltimore and pricing blacks out, as we talked about that, that uh, barbecue restaurant in Austin about a month ago, where everybody else sold and this one person refused to sell their barbecue restaurant in East Austin, even though they were offered $3 million for it. Again, if you clean up a city you're going to be accused of racism. If you make life better for everyone, that means you've made life worse for black individuals who prior to your involvement in the city, 
civic life. You know, they they lived, they thrived. Uh, and by thriving, that means that, you know, the criminality is what they exa- they existed upon. So that's the catch-22 of life in America right now. Okay. okay. Well, let's move on. Let's move on to sad stories from high IQ countries. We have a lot of those. This has to do with Korea. Last year, South Korea's fertility rate, already one of the world's lowest, fell to a record low of 0.78. That means every woman in her life can be predicted to have not even one child. That is well below even that of Japan, 1.3. And Japan is already the oldest nation in the world in terms of its age pyramid. The South Korean government has spent more than $200 billion over the last 16 years to encourage people to have more children, but they ain't doing it. The government surveys Koreans between the ages of 19 and 34 every two years and found that only 36% polled last year said they had a positive perception of marriage. That was down from 56% in 2012 who had a positive idea about marriage. 36%, only 36% think marriage is a good thing. The fall reflects the growing pressures on young South Koreans, including economic concerns, unaffordable housing, rising cost of living, and among the third of respondents with a positive perception of marriage, results skew heavily towards men. Only 28% of women have a positive view of marriage. Wow. That, that's really extraordinary. Ordinarily, you think of women as the ones who want to tie the knot, make families. This is terrible. South Korean women reported that they had safety concerns when it comes to dating, exacerbated by high-profile news stories of sex crimes, voyeurism, and gender discrimination. They're afraid to date Asian men, Korean men. Good grief. I would have thought Korean men were pretty safe, pretty safe bets, really. Women's advancements in education and the workplace also mean the opportunity cost of marriage is much higher for women now than in the past. By getting married, they may have to compromise on their career, especially given entrenched gender norms and difficulties re-entering the workplace after childbirth. In a survey of young people, more than half said they didn't see the need to have a child even after marriage, a rate that has been steadily rising since 2018. Half of young Koreans say they're not interested in having children. This is terrible. This is really absolutely terrible. And now, <coughs> here's a story from China. Hospitals across China are scrapping their maternity wards. Record numbers of young couples shun the idea of starting a family. They blame economic uncertainties. Once again, high cost of education, lack of affordable child care, the Fifth People's Hospital in Guangzhou City in Jiangxi confirmed newborn services would be suspended this month. And a hospital in Jiang, in the, in Zhejiang, the Jiangshan Hospital shut down last month all of its maternity wards. In 2023, China's population shrank for the second straight year, falling by 2 million. Gone. The seventh straight year that the birth rate has fallen and the number of maternity hospitals dropped from 807 in 2020 to 793 in 2021. That is, let's see, that is a total of uh, 14, 14 maternity hospitals have just shut from night, from 2020 to 2021. Once again, very bad news for the high IQ races. Now, another story, just to round it out, we'll have a story here about Japan. This is sort of a semi-good news story. Visitors are flocking to the city of Nagi. And in a nation struggling with record low birth rates and population decline, Nagi has become known as the miracle town, where nearly half of the households have three or more children. The local lifetime fertility rate is 2.95, more than twice the national average. 2.95. Their population is growing. As you know, Mr. Kersey, 2.2 is considered the number that each woman must have in her lifetime to reproduce herself and her husband, that extra 0.2 being to account for those who sort of don't make it along the way. Nagi has a population of 5,700. Several South Korean officials visited earlier this year 
because they want to know how it works. In the U.S., the fertility rate hit a record low of 1.64 in 2020, but has rebounded slightly. Now, 2002, back to Nagi, the town had a referendum on whether to consolidate with other neighboring towns, an initiative encouraged by the national government to streamline administrative operations. That way you just have one city hall, one school district, uh, one this, that, and one the, the other. And slightly more than the half of the town's residents voted against the proposal. But by choosing to remain independent, to have their own municipality, that meant they had to dedicate more resources to nurturing their own population. The city government cut funding for traffic safety, administrative reform, and some health and fitness activities in order to allocate more money to helping families. In 2004, Nagi began offering free medical services for children until junior high school. It also started paying payments, about $1,000 for every child born after their second. That ain't much money, frankly. No. Then, But people went through a big mental change when they chose not to merge with the other municipalities, says a city spokesman. We had to survive as a town on our own. Now, medical care in Nagi is free for children through high school. No matter what problems you have, it's free. And the $1,000 uh, $1, incentive starts with the first child, not the third. Still not that much, but a nice little bonus to come along. Uh, they'll buy a few diapers. Uh, the city subsidizes child care, education costs, and infertility treatments. Now, there, a, a Nagi, its budget is buffered by millions of dollars in loans from the national government that is trying to help areas suffering from depopulation. In April, the national government created, that was uh, uh, last year, the national government created the Children and Families Agency with an annual budget of $34 billion to encourage childbirth. And the first thing this new organization did was formulate a plan that includes mitigating the cost of child care, delivery, education, and housing while increasing lump sum allowances for parents. Now, on the other hand, some of the advantages of Nagi, remember it's a population of 5,700, this small town life will be hard to recreate in fast-paced fast cities. What really counts is the mindset of Nagi residents, which is that having children is a good thing. And not all Nagi people, not all Japanese feel that way. Now, Mr. Kersey, we have very little time, but I believe you have a short item on blacklisting. blacklisting. For the Telegraph, the term blacklisted is racist. U.S. warns its spies. <laughs> Intelligence Community Newsletter offers advice on linguistic diversity and advice from a cross-dressing spook. A lot of stuff to, to, to unpackage from that. U.S. spies, including members of the CIA, have been told the term blacklisted is racist. And an internal diversity newsletter which also offered advice from a cross-dresser. The guidance says been included in the dive a newsletter circulated by the intelligence community's uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility office. So DEI, uh, D -E -I, -A. <laughs> I guess that's where our intelligence community is headed. According to Fox News Digital, which is an analyzed document, it is packed with diversity guidance aimed at improving the accuracy of language used by the intelligence community at the expense of intelligence gathering <laughs> one of the articles discussing linguistic diversity has urged officials to refrain from using the term blacklisted this is because mr taylor it implies black is bad and white is good the term sanity check is discouraged because it is disparaging toward people with mental illness cakewalk mm -hmm. and grandfathered are also no longer regarded as accessible because of their association with slavery huh Cakewalk? I mean, I understand about people being grandfathered in. That's a Southern term. If you're, uh, if you're, uh, I think it had to do with if your father fought for the Confederacy. If you no, no, if your father, if your grandfather voted, then you can vote. Uh, I believe that was the way it worked. A grandfather, uh, but I, I thought that that was used for other, for other purposes too. But cakewalk? What's that got to do with slavery? Nothing, as far Cake as I know. But. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to try and guess the etymology of the term cakewalk with its association or correlation with slavery, but. Point is, it's great to know that the people of Langley are learning about DEI at the same time that the black mayor of Baltimore is 
basically confusing that term with the N word and then saying that his job is to make white people uncomfortable. Okay. When so what else, what else about this story here? Any, anything else? Uh, the only this? thing else from the story is that an anonymous intelligent officer wrote that his cross dressing habit has made him more effective in his role. I'm an intelligence officer and I'm a man who likes to wear women's clothes. Sometimes I think my experience as someone who cross dressing cross dresses has sharpened my skills. I use as an intelligence officer particularly critical thinking and perspective taking. So I guess that goes back to your theory of um, maybe those who identify as lavender should be the only people who get access to intelligence. Wow. Well, so cross dressing sharpens his mind. You know, I'm going to start wearing a bra. I think that's going to make me sharper, improve my memory, help my critical thinking. But I won't do that. <laughs> I won't do that till next week, ladies and gentlemen. And it is always a never. pleasure. <laughs> always a pleasure. Spend this time with you. It is really a great honor. And uh, Mr. Kersey and I look forward to doing this again next week. Thank you so much.